So I know a lot of you guys have been wondering, hey, what's going on with our engine replacement? Because we haven't talked about it in a long time. Well, it's been a long time in the making and we've had a lot of different options coming at us and available that we had to discuss and think through and decide which direction we wanted to go with it. Because as you remember, we were having a lot of issues with this guy right here. This guy is waiting to be retired. He's still holding in there for us, but every time we leave the anchor, it's always a question of not if what's going to happen, but when. So today we're going to kick off this talk with you guys and discuss some of the options that were available to us and why we decided to go certain ways over others along the way. So that is coming up now. <laughs> Okay. Hey, I'll be back soon, Tiki. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Yeah, I'm sure as many of you remember, we also have our brand new electric dinghy and we've been loving it. It's full electric propulsion, electric motor, electric battery, wiring, no engine, combustion, nothing whatsoever. So of course, this is a natural option that might be attractive for the full-size sailboat as well, right? Well, that's what we don't know, because there's issues either way. But that's all the things we're going to discuss in this next series of videos. Yeah, you'll notice here in the Anchorage, we've got a couple of our friends here with their sailboats also, and some of them have already dealt with engine replacements or repowering. So we're going to be talking to some of them today also, and just talk to them about what they have now, and what they would do differently if they had it all to do over again. And I think you guys are gonna find that very interesting. But first, we're gonna head across the island to visit one of my friends who is a cruiser, was a cruiser. He just sold his boat in Canada a little while ago, but now he's discovered San Andres and loves it. So he just arrived back on the island again yesterday. And you guys might remember Larry, because this is his third trip down <laughs> in this season. So you could, say, you could say that he really likes San Andres. But we're gonna go talk to Larry first and then come back and visit some of my friends here because they're out doing some things right now. But we'll get back there shortly. Yeah, we're gonna take a little ride across the island because Larry's got himself a place over at Booby Rock on the other side of the island. So we are gonna take a little ride. Buckle up. <laughs> every night just to plug in. That's a considerable consideration. So something we have to keep in mind also. We still own our motorcycle as you know. It's not electric, it's gas propulsion, but that's just because it's what was available to us and we just wanted something for be able to get around and have fun, but also be able to do all of our jobs while we're on the island without having to rent taxis get rides everywhere all the time because that's very limiting 
whereas the, the more of having whereas having the motorcycle is very freeing so it's been very good for us but having said that we knew it was going to be short term we never intended to have this motorcycle a long time we've had it for over well between two of them we've had them for a year now so it's pretty much time that we're going to move on from the motorcycle also because we're gearing up to go traveling again get sailing and of course the motorcycle is not practical to have to load onto and off of the boat every time we go to a new place especially a new country and then we're going to replace it with something that's a little more viable for long-term travel a little more rewarding for where we want to go and a little better exercise <laughs> so i intend to get back to a couple of probably folding bikes possibly electric bikes don't know yet and i have loved it i can't tell you how great it's been just to be able to take that opportunity and be a biker again even for a little while haven't had that chance in a long time since we started sailing so it's been nice Loma, which is one of the Rizal towns. This is where people who were born here, you know, they've always been on San Andres for generations. Their family lives up here still. So not necessarily part of the Colombia settlement, but these are the original people of San Andres. So one of the reasons I really like it up here, it's really nice people. Friendly, they just live up here in danger a little bit away from the city, just have their own world. I love coming for a little cruise up here, down through the hills. Just gotta watch the speed bumps. hardest by the hurricanes last year when we were here. I don't know if you can see, but they're just starting to fill up with more sand and rocks again and everything. It was completely ripe, just wiped clean. And of course, all these trees, everything was just stripped clean. Everything was dead brown. It took a long time to recover, but things are coming back very nicely for one year later. deep in thought. <laughs> Trying to figure out how to put a dock in here, get in and out of the water when it's this rough. Contemplation. Rough. This ain't rough. <laughs> wow. This is still calm. Yeah. Whoa. So you don't you scare see? people away. Calm. <laughs> it looks like they tried something earlier. It didn't last long. Well, with the rope? There's steps there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got to use nice metal railing or something and anchor it here and anchor it on those two rocks and project it out into the water. Good luck with that. <laughs> Why? Because this is still calm. Well, yeah. It's funny because three days ago the water was nice and flat and it was low tide and it would have been nice to do it then. Oh, yeah. We had no wind then. Wind's just starting to pick up again now. Yeah, look at the white caps out here, eh? Yeah, we're only getting, you know, 15 knots now. Yeah. Nice area, though. Oh, yeah. Very rugged. You don't want to fall on that shit. Wow. People go in and they're crawling up and cutting their feet on this and that. And 
Oh no, look at the shoreline. This is that's jagged stuff right there. Wow. That stuff hurts. Yeah, they didn't have to send the Mars rover to Mars to find this kind of terrain. <laughs> Yeah, imagine just trying to make a vehicle even just to drive over that. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Nice day. Yeah. Yeah, you guys remember my buddy Larry. He's also raining from Canada. And as I said, this is his third trip down to San Andres in the last several months. <laughs> so he enjoys it here also. But Larry is also a sailor. And you had a sailboat. You said it was a Moody... 346. You had that in Canada. Oh no, I had it in uh, Florida and sailed it down to the Keys and a little further down, but mostly sailing around Florida. But I've had lots of boats before that. Yeah, I had uh, friends with the Moody 34 years ago. That was a nice boat. Center cockpit? Yep. Yep. A nice uh, aft berth or aft cabin back there, but for a 34 and a half, 35 foot boat, it's great. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm five foot six and I don't know, even me crouching down to get into the aft cabin becomes mo monotonous after a while. It's time to get a bigger boat, I think. <laughs> so you sold that one and now you're yeah. on the search for possibly the next boat, yeah. deciding what you're going to do next, Yeah. whether it's going to involve San Andres or something here. He's actually even been talking about the Angel Bee, which is kind of cool, but the Angel Bee is a big fixer-upper project, yeah. so that's a handful to, to take on. But it is, yeah, you can build a boat from scratch and build anything you want. You've got a hull to start with. Yeah. But what was the power plant in your Moody? Like, what did you have for engine in that? Oh, it was a diesel, oh, I assume. Um, what they call it, uh, I forget now, an English make, uh, three-cylinder, um, converted from a, well, Kubota block, um, a thorny craft. That's what it is. Thorny craft? Thorny craft engine. <laughs> Never heard of that. Yep. But it starts out at a Kubota block. Yeah, and they marinize it, and then all done in England, where the boat was built also. But Thorny Craft is well known in, in England and over there as a very reliable engine. And it was, too. I don't know how many hours it had on it, but it ran good when it ran. So how many boats have you had in the past? Uh, probably sailboats, six. Sailboats. Six About sailboats. Six. All in around that same size range? Well, I've had the 27 CNC I started with, which I loved, and I went to a 30 foot Islander, and uh, I liked that boat. Put about 16,000 nautical miles on that, sailing everywhere from Fort Lauderdale right down to Venezuela, mm -hmm. and then back up and around in the St. Martin area, back down to Grenada, up and down for a 30 foot boat. It took a beating, and so did I in some places, like the Mona Passage, you know? Oh yeah, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, yeah. And coming and out Puerto of Puerto Rico and Dominican? Yeah, coming out of there. What a strong Been boat. There. Love that boat. And a 32-foot Islander, a 36-foot Islander, obviously, I like Islander boats. So these were all inboard diesels? Yeah. I assume? Yeah. So you're familiar with diesels, you've had to do your share of maintenance and work on them and everything. So now you're looking at something different. Yeah. I mean, what is your, when it comes to repowering or powering like the diesel that you would like to have in the boat, what would you be looking for now? Or if you had a chance to just put in anything you wanted oh, from scratch, yeah. knowing what's out there, whether electric, diesel, hybrid, anything like that, what would you choose based yeah. on, you know, your expertise and your budget yeah. for the next boat? Well, even years ago, I mean, my, alternative was diesel or electric it still is i looked at electric i love the idea of all electric getting all gas off the boat all diesel off the boat mm -hmm. i love the electric idea but i was waiting for battery technology to improve the price of batteries to drop you know just a, a little improvement in technology so i could go and depend on electric a little more you know and not having to start a generator to recharge my battery bank you know I want it to be self-sufficient on electricity and you know sailing sometimes you there's no wind sometimes you have to turn on the motor or just float around for days right which is a little boring for me I wait for a while but it's nice to turn on the engine and be able to have 
you know, get somewhere, get out of the weather. And that's the thing that scared me the most if I ever depleted my batteries to the point where I actually needed them and there was a front or something coming through and I had to get out of there and there wasn't the proper wind or any wind and I had to actually motor and I didn't have the power to do it. I don't like to be in that position. For this next chapter that you're going to be with your next boat, yeah. would you classify yourself that you're going to be living more at anchor or you know in and out of marinas more often like oh, when you go to no. different countries or anything yeah. where do you plan to spend most of the majority of your time as far as i'm concerned i never want to go to the marina i just i don't want to go to the dock unless i have to you know emergencies or whatever but i'd like to anchor out of course and be self totally self-sufficient and i think when electricity when your electric boat systems get to the point and I'm pretty sure, sure they are now, real close, where you can install a complete electrical system, you know, and depend on it, and not even, you know, have an internal combustion engine on the boat, just all electric. I think that time has pretty well come. So I would look at electric, yeah, but at the same time, there's some good diesel options. I love the Beta engine, the system on it. It's a good solid, engine and set up and uh, good quality so I wouldn't hesitate to go with internal combustion engine again but ultimately yeah I think I'd like to have the energy the, to deliver uh, propulsion by electricity of course I mean, but the question is where will you get that electricity from oh your solar power wind generation uh, right, but you've seen I've maxed out my solar power on my boat and I can make 10 to 12 kilowatt hours per day. Mm. But the average electric engine, like an, the electric engine for our size boat, for sophisticated lady, to replace our onboard diesel, it's a 60 kilowatt diesel. So to put a 60 kilowatt electric motor in there, yep. I have 15 kilowatts of lithium ion, or sorry, I have 15 kilowatts of light bulb batteries already, yep. lithium iron phosphate. Yep. And those batteries would be depleted in less than 15 minutes yep. running that engine at full output. Yep. At the same and time, you know, you have a you have a 50 foot boat, and you have systems in the boat um, that are, you know, they depend. They draw a lot of energy. Uh, where a smaller boat, something a 35 ish in that, I wouldn't need all those systems, and I might be able to get the wattage from the solar panels. Right, but see, that's irrelevant because you could actually get rid of all the systems on my boat, and you yep. still couldn't power the the propulsion system yep. without a generator. Right. Unless, that's why I asked you: Were you focusing on going to marinas or yep. living at anchor? Yeah, because exactly. if you are going back to a marina every night or yep. every couple of days, yep. you simply plug the boat back in, yep. just like you do your car at your house. Yeah. You plug it in, it charges up, and you're ready to go next time. So you can take off and go out and use your electric motor and in and out of the anchorage and, you know. Yep, exactly. You don't have any worries like that. But it's a different case entirely. It's a different scenario when you live on board exactly. the boat and you live at anchor. Yep. And, you know, unless you're out sailing indefinitely, constantly, all the time, every day, hmm. they have the regeneration systems. That's what I've even been testing with the e-propulsion system. But even, you know, I love UMA. I watch UMA a lot. And I see them, I've been patrons of UMA even before, but yeah. I see them promoting the full electric mm -hmm. and I love the concept, yes. but I can tell even from watching them that yeah. it's just not there yet because of the battery technology. We don't have the ability not even to store the power, but to regenerate the power. Regenerate, yep. You can put on 100 kilowatts of lithium on the boat if you want, but where are you going to replace it when it's gone after running your engine for three hours? This is the issue. Exactly. So you still can't do it without putting a diesel behind it as backup. So they always say, yeah, it's more efficient if you put in an electric motor and run it off your lithium, and then you just start up the diesel when you mm. need to recharge everything. Yeah. Because the electric motor is more efficient and it makes the diesel run more efficient. But do you know, understand what the cost of that is? <laughs> because yeah. you still need a very powerful diesel, diesel yep. to do that in the first place. Yeah. So exactly. you've got this big bank of lithium that you need to recharge. You need to run a big capacity generator to do that, at least 20 to 30 kilowatts. And if you have to put in that big an engine and that big a battery bank, in addition to the cost of the electric motor, this is where yeah. it really put me off. Yep. 
I mean, I, I would love to say I could afford to do it, but I can't afford to do that. I've looked at it, and to put in a fully integrated system with electric motor, sized in, like a suitably sized battery bank, and a backup diesel, you're looking at eighty to hundred thousand dollars easy. Yeah. No, you're right. About That's not in my budget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm amazed that it's thirty thousand dollars for a diesel engine. Yeah. Thirty thousand dollars for a diesel engine. Can you imagine? I mean, we used to spend that. You get the truck attached to the diesel yeah. engine. Yeah. Now you just get yeah. the diesel engine. Yeah. But that's the cost of a marine diesel engine these days, and now that makes you really seriously look at what are you getting for your dollar. And mm -hmm. it comes down to what you need as well. I mean, I don't know what, it's like you said, mm -hmm. if there's a storm coming, yeah. I want to get the hell out of yeah. the way. A any means possible. I got my family on board, you yeah. know, baby on board, anything like that, and I see there's a storm coming, or I know there's a storm yeah. even 100 miles away, and I need to boot it. I want to be able to boot it. Yeah. That's the safety concern. I mean, yeah, 100 years ago, you know what? Nobody had engines on their boat. Yeah. They were all 100% sail. Yeah. But we're not living 100 years ago. We're living now. We have this technology exactly. available and these options available. Yeah. And this is how we choose to live now. There's a lot of people that still live on pocket cruisers less than 30 feet. Yeah. Some people like Lynn and Larry Party, they yeah. lived for their whole life on a Seraphim, boat with yeah. no engine. Yeah. I still remember the episode. I love those guys. I watched them. They were one of the ones, you know, in addition to the shards and mm. dash you offshore and all that. I always watch Lynn and Larry Party also. And I remember when she was so happy that they took out the engine and oh, put yeah. in a, a bathtub. Yeah, Lynn, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She says she loves her bathtub. Yeah, underneath the <laughs> companionway stairs. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. A long time ago. And, and the thing about electric also is your diesel engine is going to move your boat through the water six, seven knots, fairly calm conditions. You'll never get that for a sustained period of time, if any time, with uh, electric propulsion, you know? No, see, It'll just the kill the batteries. I have a 100 gallon or 400 liter fuel tank for diesel on board, and the boat will average about seven knots at an efficient operating speed of the diesel. Yeah. That gives us a 700 mile range. Yeah. If I tried to do 700 miles with an electric, electric <laughs> engine, no. With a hundred kilowatts of battery power, and you have no idea, that's a big amount of space required for a mm. hundred kilowatts of battery power. Mm -hmm. You run it even at a quarter throttle or half throttle, you know, you'll be doing three to four knots, okay, but you're still going to be using 15 to 20 kilowatts on that motor, minimum. Yep. That means you have maximum, let's say five to six hours, even if we're being conservative, mm -hmm. generous. Mm -hmm. five to six hours to use 100 kilowatts of power at three to four knots yep you got a 20 <laughs> what 25 mile range yeah 30 25 30 mile range now most people say it. well we're not gonna motor anyway mm -hmm. we're out there to sail well yep. yeah i get it and i hear you but yep. that's not always the case in today's situation now we have information available with storms approaching yep. stuff like that if you just want to move you just want to move you yep. don't want to be sitting there thinking oh my god my battery's gonna die yeah Am I going to die because I can't get out of the way? Yeah. Because you have exactly. this information now exactly. that the storm is coming and you can't get out of the way. Yeah. That's a big difference over where we were a hundred years ago. Yeah. You know, we have this technology now. I mean, you can pre-plan ahead like you do with your weather onboard weather charts and the information that you get online of an upcoming storm, maybe three days, two days ahead, maybe something like that. And you can, with the electric, start moving. But for two or three days, believe me, you're probably going to be pretty worried about your power and being able to get out of the way. Where I think with the diesel engine, if you got fuel and a good engine, you know you're going to get out of the way. Well, see, you that's know. the thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, with the fuel in my tank, I've got a 700 yeah. mile range just to keep going. Yeah. But even from UMA, we learned that... You know your range is going to be very short and i mm. watched them in so many videos going oh my god i hope we make it to the next marina because yeah. they were just they were basically oh, yeah. promoting their lifestyle as going from marina to marina because they needed that electricity exactly and that's not what i want from an electric engine if i'm oh. going to spend that much money to get there and even they sooner or later they ended up buying a little portable yeah, they, yeah, generator yeah 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 but even that that's like a two kilowatt generator mm -hmm. that's not going to power their motor mm -hmm. it'll give them a backup power supply which they needed <laughs> yeah congrats on that i'm glad you finally at least did something to you know back yourself up a little bit so you're not going to be 
putting yourself at risk at if you risk, can't make yeah. it to the next marina, put it that way. Exactly. We all don't need electricity. We like to have electricity. We have all these things we like to have. Is it a need to have, or like to have, or want to have? Yeah. That's a personal decision only you can answer. Yeah. 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 You have to weigh it between, you know, your safety and how you cruise and how you want to cruise and the situations you may find yourself in you know if you want to go on long hauls long trips and you know or you're just dropping into bays every night or something it's it's up to the individual you know well, it right. depends on it what their plans are but yeah i mean the internal combustion engine is the way to go and yeah. I remember we learned yeah. from you from Umo as well yeah. that you can regenerate some power. Yeah. The new systems are getting better at yes. that. Yeah. But I think they proved that the most they could get was 500, maybe 600 watts 600, at yeah. full speed. Yeah. Now, okay, if you can if you continue doing that speed 24 hours a day, that means that you can effectively put a maximum of 10 to 12 kilowatt hours into the battery bank in 24 hours. Let's randomly say 500 watts. Yeah, yeah. 500 watt hours per hour means two hours per kilowatt hour. Right. So that's 12 per day, or best case scenario. Yeah. That's gonna get you about, what, 10 to 15 minutes of propulsion at the other end of it when you turn the engine back on. So I don't really see, yeah. you know, depending on the speed you're trying to run, if you're only trying to do two, three knots, then sure, you might get three, four hours, but you're only gonna do two, three knots, you're gonna get six, seven miles. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the technology might not be there quite yet. But no, I love the idea. Even oh, of, I do. Even of having the backup diesel wouldn't bother me so much, but $100,000, yeah. you know, $80,000, 70, I don't care. It's just way too much to be putting into a propulsion system mm -hmm. for a 45 to 50 foot boat. Mm -hmm. It's not in the budget of not me. And certainly I don't think most of you guys, I think you would agree that that's a lot of money just for a propulsion system. Now that takes us back yeah. down, you know, the two options now are okay well what diesel do you choose or do you go hybrid mm. because they have hybrids that are a combination of electric motor with a diesel engine and I was looking at those also and that's a very attractive option it's a little bit more reasonably priced mm -hmm. but you're looking at a 20 kilowatt motor yeah with about 10 to 12 kilowatts of regeneration power now they say that in ideal conditions which of course you're never going to generate 12 kilowatts no matter what you do unless somebody's dragging you dragging. behind a freighter yeah exactly <laughs> It's just not feasible. We're not there yet with the regeneration capabilities. Exactly, yeah. But the idea is, if you power up your diesel, the regeneration capabilities of the electric motor are sufficient that you can put probably 10 kilowatts of direct DC power back into your battery bank. Yeah. Now, of course, nothing comes for free. If you're making power from your diesel, you're using extra fuel. So no matter how you look at it, even if you're using your motor because you need the motor and it's calm, and you'd only do three, four knots, you still are using more fuel to keep the regeneration capabilities going from the power as well. Still yeah. increasing fuel consumption amount. We all know you can't make electricity from nothing. Yep. If you're doing it from your engine, it's coming from excess fuel con consumption. So then again, it boils down to the cost because if I can use the 20 kilowatt motor when I want to, just to get out of Anchorage or anything like that, and then we sail long enough and regenerate it, then I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. That's an, that's an attractive option. But when you need the diesel, boom, you fire it up and it's there and you go. Yeah. So if for months at a time you never need the diesel that much, and then it's gonna pay off over a period of time. But how long is that period of time? Because the investment for my size of boat was between fifty to $60,000 to take a $30,000 engine and equip it with electric propulsion in a hybrid configuration. Mm -hmm. Not including batteries, you're still looking at batteries. Okay, you still have to do your batteries. Now you've got a diesel and electric system, so you've got to back up to both, but you still have to have your lithium system installed separately. Yeah. Then you have to look at the cost of the lithium system. I mean, on average, lithium is coming down fast, yeah. which is great. I really love the fact that lithium is starting to come down, but you're still, even on a good day and a good deal for reliable equipment like lifium ferrous phosphate, you know. LifePo 4 batteries, Lipo 4. not lithium ion. We yep. don't want lithium ion on our boats. That's, it's okay in a Tesla, you know, if it melts down and explodes, you can step out of your car and you're safe. Yeah. But if it melts down and sets fire on your boat, you're going down. So we don't want lithium ion. There's just too many issues with that technology. It's much smaller, lighter, cheaper, but it's not safe for our environment. So that's why we stick with the LifePo 4. 
but you're looking at about I think we're down to about maybe five thousand dollars four to five thousand dollars per 10 kilowatts now for 10 kilowatts so that means if you want to put in a 50 kilowatt bank yeah mm -hmm. you know you're looking at twenty four twenty five thousand dollars something like that but that's a lifetime investment as well so you have to look at the fact that these types of batteries lithium ion they're typically rated for about 800 recharge cycles mm -hmm. The LIFO 4 yeah. rated for minimum 3,000. Yeah. It's quite a difference. It's more expensive, and of course it takes more space. That's the trade-off. Yeah. And a little bit more heavy. Not yeah. too much. Lithium is lithium, but yeah, the two technologies are still, you know, a little bit this way and that way. So I don't know. I weighed all of those options, but I'm still looking towards a direct diesel replacement. And as much as I don't like the fact that we'd still be burning fuel, I want to get rid of that. I'm just not in a position or in a budgetary position mm -hmm. or a safety position to think about the fact that we're there with ready to go with electric yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just my opinion. We all have our opinion, guys. I know yeah. you're gonna have your own opinion. And don't worry, tell me what your opinion is. Put it in the comments below, because we'll discuss it in the next video. This is an open forum. We're making decisions on the fly here and we're educating you know with information that's available to all of us so want to know what you guys think also but in my case i'm boiling down to what diesel i'm going to be looking at and that's going to be you know a matter of how serviceable is it at sea yeah mine has been incredibly serviceable i've had instances when i completely hydro locked it right mm. before a hurricane coming in and i still managed to fix it at sea by myself <laughs> I'm sure some of you probably remember that. That was a video just a few years ago when my son was on board. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I know a lot of these newer systems, that's another topic altogether. If you were going to consider this a straight diesel, what would it be? Would you go for the ultra modern computerized high efficiency model or something that, you know, may not be a little bit more of a big block boxy thing, but you can fix it. Yeah. So I, don't, I don't know. Everybody's I think that, different. I think, uh, for me, I think Beta's, you know, for me, I like the Beta brand. It's so efficient. But what else is out there? Like what have you looked at that you've been considering? Well, I look at the regulars like the Yanmar and Volvo and and uh, uh, what a what's the what's the yellow one? <laughs> yellow one? Cat? Yeah. No. Caterpillar? Uh, I don't know. From uh, Europe. Anyways, but um, I'm haven't had much luck or not a lot of good luck from Yanmar and Volvo and the parts are expensive. It would be nice to have an engine in my boat where if I needed parts, I could get them, you know, from a farm store, you know, because yeah. with, the, with the Beta engine, it's a Kubota engine, right? Block engine. Well, that's, I've been lucky that way with the Perkins up to now because a lot of the service components have been for tractor Tractors. engines. Yeah. The only parts that aren't that I'm up against now yeah. are the aluminum tanks that they marinize the engine with you know, the, the, the cooling system, like the heat exchangers, heat system? exchangers yeah. all of that kind of stuff. Those are very expensive now, and those are what keeps rotting out that I have to keep replacing, and now they're like $1,000 each. Oh yeah. That's one of the things that I decided, or made me decide, no, it's time to replace this engine because it's just too expensive to keep replacing those things for long distance travel. If I'm in the middle of the Pacific, it's not gonna be easy to find. Yep. If I was in the BVI's, well, yeah, there's a place right there that's Perkins everything. You can get all the parts for as long as they still have them in stock. Mm -hmm. But I decided it was more time to start looking at a full-blown replacement with something newer, but I'm also afraid of the newer technology because they're making stuff a lot lighter and yeah. thinner than it used to be. Yeah, I just don't like that, you know. My engine's yeah. like a thousand pounds. Well, uh, 4108 Perkins, isn't it? 4238. Or 4238, oh yeah. Yeah, that's... It's like a thousand pounds, and that's, uh, you know, it's a solid cast block. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I got 17, I tell people I got 17,000 hours out of that engine. They're like, what? Wow. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, <laughs> 17,000 hours. That's the thing. Well, you look after it, it, keep, yeah. it keeps going. Yeah. It still runs great, we just have some cooling issues, but it resolves some of those. But again, it's just a matter of what's gonna be next if we start crossing oceans. Yeah. I don't wanna be fixing something in the middle of the Pacific and a storm coming at us. Yeah, the, en the lifetime of that engine, whether uh, being pro and being properly maintained is coming to an end, you know, eventually, and you'll be somewhere in the Pacific somewhere. Oh, people say you can rebuild it to brand new, and oh, yes, yeah. I know it oh, costs yeah, five, sure. six thousand dollars to rebuild it. I looked yeah. into that, that was the first option we looked at, but I'm still going to be left with a 26 year old block that at yep. some point is going to require something else that's yep. going to become harder and harder to find. Yeah, exactly. You have so many systems on your boat. That's one system that you really don't want to 
take chances on or Mickey Mouse yeah. the propulsion system. It's pretty much your backup on all of your security. Yeah. It's your backup. If everything is going to shit and you need to get away, get out of the way of something yeah. or, you know, whatever the reason, you need your engine, you need your engine. Yeah. So, no, yeah. I want to be able to count on it without having to worry about, you know, what's going to happen next in the middle of the ocean. And I've been, <laughs> you guys know, I've done my share of repairs on that engine in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> And I've been lucky so far. It hasn't conquered me yet, but... Yeah. Like, I, I personally don't want to discount the electric propulsion, but I have never had a boat that's 50 foot before. My boat's all been, I think, the biggest was 35 foot. Uh -huh. So, you know, you look at things differently. You, know, you look at, maybe I could uh, put an electric system on it where it would be feasible to do it for the sailing that I do. But when you have a bigger boat, things change. The cost goes up exponentially. Because yeah. if you're going to go with an under 40 foot boat, yeah, yeah you can put in a smaller electric motor yeah. and a smaller battery bank yeah. backed up by a smaller diesel and you're into less than I'd have to pay for just the oh, diesel. For sure. So for you, it's more viable. Yeah. But, you know, when you get into these size of boats, the most popular size of cruising boats, as you can see, even in the anchorage yeah. here all the time, the, yeah. the most popular boats you find in these anchorages are always 44 to 50 feet. Yeah. That's the most common size. Yeah. Catamarans are usually 40 to 44 feet. Mm. So they're about that same size range internal volume as the when you get into the 48 to 50 footers. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I have not discounted electric. No, I just don't just, think it's viable. Yeah. See, on it, your boat. It becomes more sorry, viable yeah. when you get into 60, 70, 80, 90 footers because those are people who have gold cards coming out their exactly. ass. Exactly. You know, they're like, they can experiment. $100,000. Yeah. Give me two in case one breaks. Yeah, they can take the $100,000 <laughs> hit if it doesn't work properly. That's not me. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm very no. concerned about the budget. We have oh, to analyze the cost of every single thing that goes into this boat because we want as long a term of lifespan out of it as possible with as few issues as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, electric is going to be less maintenance long run, but if it's so much expensive up front that we can't afford it, it's just not there. But give it another five years, maybe yep. ten, yep. I think we're going to be there entirely. Exactly. Who knows? Maybe we'll have Mr. Fusion reactors on board then, yep. you know? Yep. <laughs> That'll make our electricity yep. from just our garbage cans. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Who knows? The te technology is changing so fast. It's well, it is. In that energy source. Right field. now, our problem is storage, but it's also generation. So. Yep. There's going to be leaps and bounds made, I think, in the next five to ten years on storage and generation. I, uh, I, agree. I don't doubt that for a minute. I don't doubt that a bit either. Hmm. Well, the price of batteries have dropped so significantly since they came out. And they will continue to do so as more people adopt the technology now that it is dropping in price. So yeah. that's a good thing for lithium. Then it just becomes a matter of how much lithium do we have. Yeah. You know, how much planets, like how much lithium does the planet have in capabilities that we can use yeah. <laughs> harvesting. What are the costs of the harvesting? You know, I've seen all these videos too about where they bring the lithium from and mm -hmm. the people that work in sweaty caves, just like kids working sweatshops in China and stuff like that. It's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, but we have to know, this is all information that we all need to know. Where does this stuff come from? Not just that it's available and this is how much it costs, where does it come from and is it sustainable also if it's no different than coal or oil or something and it has a very limited lifespan yeah. then we're still chasing up the wrong tree yeah how so, do you how do you dispose of it how you know what do you do with it then yeah it has a much longer lifespan i mean i think that we're looking at my battery bank on board they yeah. told me a minimum 10 years yeah but i've been monitoring the charge discharge cycles and how the computer watches and everything and i think that we're looking at minimum 15 maybe almost 20 years of lifespan out of those batteries oh yeah i i wouldn't be surprised you, you easily get six thousand recharges on it yeah i think that the, the cases will probably give out before the battery cells do <laughs> yeah maybe you know the plastic might deteriorate faster i don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> as long as we keep it out of the sun i guess yeah yeah you got to keep a boat around it so mm -hmm. yeah but yeah, anyway, I mean, this was just meant to start a conversation with you guys about what I've been considering, what yeah. I know other people are considering. I'm going to talk to other people as well. We'll probably do that in the next video because I want to keep a lot of this information here. It's interesting to find out what guys like Larry have in their own minds and, you know, their own experience as well. So we're going to talk to other people the same. But if you guys got questions, again, write them in the comments below and we'll look at them for sure. I guarantee you we'll read the questions and see if we can answer some of them in the next videos, maybe with some of the next people that we talk to about their scenarios. So, 
Exactly. All right, thanks, Larry. No problem. I yeah, appreciate the time. Good. And I'm sure we'll see you around again. Mm -hmm. Next beer somewhere. Yep. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Uh, salute. Stay safe. And we'll see you out there. Ciao for now. Thank you.